Ladies and gentle nerds, welcome to a brand new episode of the Nerd Byword, the podcast that brings all the nerds to the yard. I'm Dave, here with my co-host Chris, and we're ready to bring you another exciting episode. Today, we are celebrating six months of Nerd Byword with a special look at notable pop culture friendships. But first, the news. Chris, what's happening? Well, the first real domino has fallen, and... and someone is finally giving in to the theatrical release game of chicken. Um, Warner brothers is going to release wonder woman, 1984 uh, simultaneously on Christmas day as a theatrical release, but also on their streaming service, HBO max. So this is a pretty significant shift. Um, it also, I, I read a really interesting variety article by uh, Rebecca Rubin, um, kind of on the on the backstory behind this decision and how um, you know it was a really really tough um, position that Warner Brothers was in because you know th- I was shocked to find out that this film was done wrapped and everything was done with it in 2018. So this movie has been sitting there for two years waiting to be released and they did not want to delay it any further into 2021. Um, and they also, you know, didn't want to lose a whole bunch of money uh, being a, a $200 million film uh, with a with a budget of $200 million. Um, they also were kind of um, kowtowing, if you will, to uh, Christopher Nolan and, and released Tenet, uh, his film Tenet, to uh, a very, very lackluster theatrical release, as you might expect, uh, you know, during a global pandemic. So they were trying to grow beyond that and, and do something different. So this is the decision that they landed at. Um, you know, so as an HBO Max subscri- subscriber, I'm very, very excited. You know, come Christmas morning, I'll be able to watch this film, um, you know, that that has been pushed back and delayed. And it is really interesting to it's going to be really interesting to watch um, how things are going to develop going forward, you know, with really big, uh, highly anti- anticipated blockbusters like Black Widow. Uh, the new 007 film, you know, uh, what what's going to happen and if other companies uh, are going to follow suit. Um, in this article, they did address that, um, you know, Disney Plus, you know, releasing Hamilton, um, you know, kind of made them a little bit nervous as well. So that may have played into this decision. But no matter, you know, what kind of corporate competition they're playing at, you know, with uh, trying to keep up with the Joneses of the streaming service and, and give HBO Max a, a significant foothold in the streaming wars. No matter what, Dave, we get to watch Wonder Woman on Christmas Day. And, and that's a win for nerds around the world. I totally agree with that. And really, Warner is outclassing uh, Disney with this release. You know, uh, when the live action Mulan, for example, popped up on uh, Disney Plus, they wanted an additional $30 uh, to to watch the Mulan live action remake. And that was a pretty steep price in addition to the subscription cost. Here, not a penny more in addition to the HBO Max subscription cost. That's one heck of a deal. You know, look, these are unprecedented times, and I can't even begin to figure out how this will affect theaters or any p- potential sequels for Wonder Woman or the movie industry as a whole. Th- there's c- clearly a lot of question marks right now. I just don't know what they're going to do. What I do know is that even for this one month, I will subscribe to HBO Max. Uh, I will support this release with my cash money. Uh, My birthday is near Christmas Day, and this seems to be the perfect gift to myself. I loved the first Wonder Woman movie. I've been dying to see the sequel, and I'm not risking a visit to the theater during the surging COVID-19 crisis that we're in right now. But Warner will get some of my hard-earned cash uh, for this release. I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was a, a pretty steep and, and interesting decision by Disney with Mulan as well. Um, you can pay $30 and watch it now or just wait until December. And they were very, very upfront with that. Like, if you can wait until December, it's just going to be on Disney Plus at no extra cost. So I'm waiting until I think it's December the 4th it's coming on on the platform you know, without that, that $30 price tag, I I think I'm good to wait. I've waited this long, but yeah, so I'm all, you know, like I said, I'm interested to see where we go from here. Um, I, 
I'm a, I'm a big homebody to begin with. So anytime that they want to release something, you know, to a streaming service, it's, it's a win for me. Um, I will go to the, the, the theaters maybe once or twice a year. Um, more, more often than not, I'm waiting until it's been released, but, uh, uh, so, so I'm excited. So we get to watch Wonder Woman and, and this is a win for all of us. Yes, and I think there's I think there's also a lot more stuff uh, going to be happening in the streaming realm period, not just with the shift of theatrical movies over, but it's just more original content too. I know I just recently read an article, and this would have been a new story in itself almost, but uh, I know that Disney, uh, according to some rumors, is actually considering taking several of its live action remakes that originally were supposed to get theatrical releases, including uh, their Cruella de Vil movie. Uh, and actually just dumping them onto Disney Plus and trying to build up their subscriber base uh, f- as you know their primary source of income for that movie, which is really interesting and a completely different business model. And again, uh, it begs the question of where, where m- movie theaters are going to end up in all of this uh, if there's such a huge shift towards using streaming services to release what would have been theatrical tentpole movies. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm really getting uh, flashbacks to our conversation with John Jackson Miller about how, you know, the comic book industry is going to have to evolve going forward um, in light of the pandemic. And, and, you know, that that is much of the same when it comes to um, even more so, I think, you know, with the movie theater business and the entertainment business going forward. So it's going to be a very, very interesting thing to to watch and develop, um, you know, as as time comes. Uh, Dave, your news story. Um, I mean, I, I'm at my wits end with this with this story. Uh, what do you got for us? I will freely admit that I have a vein bulging on my forehead right now. Um, I'm really not quite sure how how to even talk about this story. So we're back to the good old fashioned Snyder cut of the Justice League. We led our uh, very first episode with uh, the story of the Snyder Cut, and here we are yet again talking about it. It's the gift that keeps on giving, uh, and I put gift definitely in quotes here. So Zack Snyder has been talking a lot lately about his upcoming four-hour Justice League recut that will be released to HBO Max. And the more he speaks, the less excited I get. You know, first there was a lot of talk of reshoots for additional footage, Now it turns out that amounts to about four minutes and is rumored to focus primarily on Jared Leto's Joker. Thanks, Zach. Exactly what we all wanted. (laughs) More of Jared Leto's Joker. Uh, The weirdest statement he's made about the miniseries, though, came during an interview with YouTube's The Film Junkie. So here's what he said, and I quote, My ideal version of the movie is the black and white IMAX version of the movie. That, to me is the most fan-centric, most pure, most Justice League experience. Because that's how I lived with the movie for two years in black and white. When I do live uh, the live stream of the trailer, Steph and I colored a black and white version of the trailer. Now, I understand that he's apparently lived with the movie in black and white while he's been editing it. But the entire first part of his statement is hogwash. A black and white Justice League movie would not be the most fan-centric, the most (laughs) pure, or the most Justice League experience. Zach, have you actually read a Justice League comic book? There is actual color in there. You know, fans have been critical of the washed-out colors of Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. We're talking about Superman, a character that parades around in primary colors. He should pop off the screen like he pops off a comic book page. And most Justice League heroes, with the exception of Batman, obviously, should pop off the screen. Zack Snyder's answer to the criticism about washed-out colors seems to be, yes, yes, let's, let's just remove those completely. I don't need a Justice League movie that looks to be Fifty Shades of Grey. I just don't know anymore who this movie is even for. It doesn't feel like it's really for the comic book fans. There seems to be no love or respect for the source material in this project, which just makes me sad. I love the Justice League. Justice League Unlimited is one of my all-time favorite cartoons. Morrison's run on JLA, bonkers as it is, stands as one of my favorite team comics of all time. I've been dying for an adaptation on the big screen of the Justice League. And absolutely, the theatrical cut we received was subpar and disappointing. 
But this doesn't seem to be the grand savior of this story either. So to those of you who will enjoy this movie and are looking forward to it, I'm happy for you. I really am. I'll be over here waiting for a Justice League movie that captures the spirit of the comics. That's what I would like to see. Chris, what are your thoughts on this story? I, this is... The man sounds like he's in a downward spiral. And and it sounds like there is a never-ending moving target for what his vision is for this. I don't think he clearly knows what he wants this movie to be because it went from all oh, the Snyder cut, which you would just assume to be a, you know, a theatrical release, you know, two hour film, then, you know, a director's cut. Sure. Maybe it's three hours. And now it's an HBO max six part mini series, four hours long, and that's not enough. And now it's, well, if you don't like it, it's because it should be in black and white. I think he's trying to cover his ass, basically. And he knows that it's going to be crappy um, and, and try to protect himself because there's going to be, you know, negative reviews of it because it's not good. He He turned out one of the absolute worst, worst superhero movies i have ever seen in my life and i've seen batman and robin batman versus superman <laughs> batman versus superman is is literally one of the worst it's up there with green lantern and fan four stick as the worst superhero films i've ever seen i i i pour one out regularly to the poor shrew that died to give jesse eisenberg hair uh as lex luther in that in that film <laughs> Like, ah, uh, and then we're so like, you know, and, and like we went back with this, you know, we've, it feels like we talk about the Snyder cut a lot on this show, which is, you know, really upsetting. We, we talked about this with Mike Lawrence and we couldn't trust him to make one good superhero movie with, you know, BVS. Why are we thinking that more Zack Snyder superhero stuff is going to be good? It's like. I ah, oh, it's so frustrating because it's this constant moving target, and he's just like throwing a bunch of stuff in that is not good. Jared Leto's Joker was awful. Why are we getting more of it? And with the Justice League, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. The Justice League is one of the most colorful. You know, teams, of course, you have black, uh, you know, Batman, who is primarily, you know, dark, but you have Superman parading around in his underwear that are red and blue. You have Wonder Woman, who has that patriotic red, white and blue montage. You have the Flash, who is in very, very bright red and yellow, uh, you know, costumes. You have the Green Lantern. That's a very, very stark color filled you know, thing. You have the Martian Manhunter, who's a freaking alien, and it, you know his costume is very, very bright. How in the hell is is a black and white IMAX the ideal version of a film? Like, I, I'm really worried about. Like, are you okay, dude? Are you okay? Because this is not. This seems like the incoherent mutterings of someone who just really buys their own. This seems like a tin foil hat wearing individual who's in charge of making superhero movies. It's very odd to me to begin with. Like it's, it's a matter of what he's adapting, you know, like if you look at, at his overall, like, you know, um, history and movies, his filmography, like the way that he, for example, made, the movie 300 made perfect sense when you consider the source material that he was adapting um to to some extent the way he adapted watchmen made sense based on the source material that he was adapting but in this particular case it's just not the tone the the idea of going black and white all of those things don't seem to fit the source material. It's like he is twisting the source material into a pretzel 
trying to make it something that it's not. I mean, if you want to, if you want to make a really cool black and white adaptation of something, you know, there are so many cool black and white comic books out there where I would say that's super appropriate, but superheroes don't lend themselves to that. Their very nature is, you know, bright, colorful, over the top, larger than life. And, and to keep trying to subdue them and to, to make them gloomy and dark, it's, it seems counterintuitive, ultimately. So, you know, again, I, you know, I am not opposed to, you know, reinterpretations. Um, and I've spoken about this before. I, you know, Heath Ledger's Joker uh, was clearly not the Joker of the comic books. It was top to bottom a reinterpretation, but one that still worked within the context of the story and still uh, had a connection to the comic books. Uh, this, the longer it goes on, the, the more disconnected it feels from what a comic book fa- fan would actually want to see in a Justice League movie. Yeah, and, and this this from a, a sci-fi wire piece that, that I read, it, it really just pinpoints everything that I I think about this upcoming project. Snyder, and I'm quoting from the article directly, um, and the author I want to give credit to is Nevaeh Sarayo. So I I want to give them credit. Um, uh, Snyder notes that despite his being a fan of all the different takes on the character out there, meaning the Joker, even Joaquin Phoenix's latest in bold, Academy Award winning one, he'd wanted Leto's incarnation when making this one. So I have full disclosure, I've not seen, you know, Joker. I've not seen it. You know, I've I've heard that it's very, very dark. And, um, you know, when in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, I'd like to watch uplifting content right now. Um, So I have not seen it, but I've heard great things about it. And for God's sake, he he won an Academy Award for it. And your response to that is to go with, yeah, I want the the one that was much, much more poorly received. Uh, I mean, it's just I I'm 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 at a loss for words at this point when it comes to Zack Snyder's vision for for uh the justice league i i just don't know anymore man i don't either i I think that's what it comes down to i'm i'm becoming increasingly unsure if if i if i even want to try to watch this you know and maybe he'll blow my mind and it's actually really good who knows but it, it seems increasingly unlikely based on the statements he's making well that's it for the nerd news segment stick around after the break we'll be back with notable nerd friendships Welcome back. You know, for many months, uh, Chris and I played with the idea of taking our friendship into the realm of podcasts. The boredom of quarantine finally made our dream a reality six months ago. And today, we've decided to celebrate six months of podcasting our nerdy friendship out to the world by taking a closer look at some other nerdy friendships. Chris, which notable pop culture friendship would you like to talk about first? Well, first and foremost, you know, it's it's one of the fandoms that I led with on our nerd origin story. Um, I'm I'm a huge webhead, as our listeners know, and um, you know there was a lot a um, lot of you know mixed reactions when when Miles Morales was was created, um, but I think Peter Parker's reaction um, and relationship to Miles has been the absolutely perfect, pitch perfect reaction to a new Spider Man. Uh, more is better, and diversity is great. Um, I love the relationship that Peter Parker and Miles Morales have. I love the big brother, little brother relationship that the two of them share across almost every medium that I've seen them in. Um, My personal favorite crossover between the two of them is um, Brian Michael Bendis' Spider-Man, the the first one from 2012. Uh, It's a five-issue limited series uh, where... I believe they go to the ultimate universe as memory serves. It's been a couple of years since I read it, but they go to the ultimate universe um, and 616 Peter, you know, it meets Aunt May and, and Gwen and MJ and all of that universe. 
um, th that Miles lives in. And it's just this beautiful thing. And he is never for a moment jealous. Um, and this continues on even after the Secret Wars. Um, and, you know, Miles is brought into the 616 proper. Peter is never jealous. He is never envious of of miles he is never hey this is my gig get your own name get your own superhero moniker kid get your own gig he is always welcoming he is always loving towards him he is always appreciative of miles and and what he brings to the costume um and this was also most recently beautifully encapsulated in in spider-man into the spider-verse Probably, if I had to say, my absolute favorite superhero movie ever. It, it's just a, such a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, th from the animation to the the life lessons um, about friendship, about responsibility and power, um, and and what it means to be a superhero, and the fact that it can be anybody under the mask, and you know you have. You know, a, a lot of times some of these crossover spider events can be overwhelming with this person, you know, has the spider totem, this person, this person, this person in every possible alternate universe. It's like too much of a good thing with with alternate realities and, you know, this spider person and this spider persona. But um, it, it's just a beautiful relationship between the two of them that I appreciate so much um, and just passing on that that um, tutelage that he received from uncle Ben onto miles. And there's no animosity whatsoever, even though, you know, the fandom uh, unfortunately is, is a little bit too vitriol for my taste. Uh, you know, oftentimes it, it's just a beautiful relationship that the two of them share uh, that, that I think is just top notch in, in comics. Uh, what do you think, Dave? Yeah, I can agree with this. I mean, I'm not as well versed, in you know current spider-man comic books uh as you are um but i did read spider-man um and i really enjoyed it uh i i really enjoyed the ultimate universe period and you know bringing 616 peter parker into that was a really interesting setup to me to begin with and i really liked the age that that miles was at at that point um he was very young to be a spider-man um and i think that added something to their dynamic um, I really loved Into the Spider-Verse as well. Uh, and the older Peter Parker sort of mentoring uh, Miles was was a lot of fun. So I can totally agree with that. But again, I'm not super familiar with what the relationship looks like now um, in the 616 universe. Uh, now that Miles is older and has been, you know, kind of removed from the Ultimate Universe. I'm definitely interested to read more about uh, their friendship uh, and as it stands now in Marvel comic books. Um, but, you know, I've, I've kind of mentioned this before. I'm always hesitant about them aging up characters when they're kind of at a unique age. I really liked Miles' initial age, and now it's, it's just another teenager, really. Um, but I am very interested to see what, what their status is, and I would really like to pick up some comic books to see them interact with each other. Well, yeah, and absolutely, uh, and I've recommended it before on the show, and I would I would recommend it again. Saladin Ahmed's you know current run on Miles's book. Um, they haven't really. It's been a couple years, uh, at least if memory serves, since they've had you know any kind of meaningful interactions. They kind of are are you know doing their own stories right now. Nick Spencer, uh, you know, on Amazing. Um, there's a, there's a little bit, um, with the last remains arc right now that, 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 uh, that miles is involved with, but it's nothing super over the top inclusive where they're involved. It's just kind of appearing there. But, um, yeah, I, I just really, really appreciate that, um, that, that, um, uh, and it's a different type of friendship too. It's not like, Hey pal, like, let's go grab a beer or, you know, let's go eat pizza. They're not like buddy buddy per se is just like a, a different type of relationship and like a mentorship and and like a big brother little brother that um you know is, is pretty unique to comic books now dave your first relationship i have absolutely no exposure to what's first on deck for you well i will say that uh, anybody even uh slightly well versed in the history of dc comics will definitely appreciate uh, this particular friendship being on the list and that is of course blue beetle and booster gold 
Uh, here are two B-list heroes that I absolutely adore. Uh, Ted Cord, the tech-savvy Blue Beetle, and Booster Gold, the somewhat selfish, glory-seeking hero from the future. I'm particularly fond of Booster. Um, I generally prefer the, the Jaime Reyes version of Blue Beetle. I've always likened it to DC's answer to Ultimate Spider-Man, and I really enjoy that character. But in the context of his friendship with Booster Gold, uh, I think Ted Cord is a fantastic character. Now, the two characters were part of a legendary era of Justice League comics in the late 80s, Justice League International. It's sometimes referred to as the Bwahaha era because it took a more humorous approach to superheroics. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, Keith Giffen and uh, J.M. Demetrius uh, doing really good work on that book. Um, and at a time when the book was filled with humor and B-list characters, Beetle and and Booster Gold basically formed the heart of the team. Uh, they became sort of the the humorous center of a really strong comic book. You know, through multiple storylines, the two were always there for each other, but they also always showed a willingness to laugh at each other and even to laugh at themselves, which is sort of the best kind of friendship in my book. In the lead up to the crossover Infinite Crisis a few years ago, Ted Cord was murdered, uh, which uh, set up, you know, the Jaime Reyes version of Blue Beetle and also sent uh, Booster Gold sort of on a series of time travel adventures in an effort to try to save his friend. Uh, via time travel and even reboots, the two characters continue to gravitate towards each other uh, as often as writers can put them together, even though, um, you know, Ted Cord had passed away. They seem to just work best as a pair. Uh, they're friends in their dedication to each other, but they are also friends in that they often disagree and, and annoy each other. Uh, and it's great. It's a great give and take between two characters that are very different from each other, but who still manage to find common ground. Uh, so I really appreciate those two characters and their friendship. It's you know been around since the 80s. And anytime uh, I get a chance to pick up a comic book that has uh, you know Booster Gold and Blue Beetle teaming up, it's just, it's going to be a good time. Well, you said the magical words, J.M. DeMatteis, so I'm absolutely sold, and I'm definitely going to be investigating this matter further. Um, but but in your description, it sounds a lot like a relationship that almost made my list, and it was it's an honorable mention, and that is of uh, Cannonball Sam Guthrie and my one of my absolute favorites, uh, Sunspot, uh, Roberto da Costa. Now, please do not judge them on the theatrical product that you saw, because that is not you know, the be all end all when it comes to, to uh, Sam and Birdo. Um, my particular favorite iterations of those characters are done by Jonathan Hickman in his Avengers run. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Exactly what you said about kind of annoying each other, getting on each other's skin, but at the same time being inseparable. Um, but I'm definitely intrigued to to study this further. And it's funny that you say that because Jaime Reyes is the Blue Beetle that I know by playing the Injustice video games. So um, when I saw Ted Kord's name, I was like, huh? So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely interested. And, and I must I must admit, like seeing a lot of DC characters, um, you know, different ones taking up the mantle of these, you know, characters, it, it seems a li it's a little bit daunting. So um, that's one of the things that that makes me a little bit standoffish with with diving into DC content is, you know, there's three or four Blue Beetles, uh, you know, all the Robins, I don't know where a good jumping on point is, um, the Superboys and, and, you know, all this stuff. But uh, you you hit some some magical notes and you said jm de mateus who is one of my all-time favorite comic book writers you know and i and i will say uh you know the idea of legacy is baked into dc comics much more so um th than marvel i believe and so what the kind of relationship that you are seeing for example with spider-man and miles that you appreciate so much you know the the passing of the baton almost a little bit that occurs quite frequently in in DC comics. I mean, Jaime Reyes is technically the third blue beetle. Um, you know, there have been several iterations of the flash. Uh, there have been other Batman, believe it or not. So it, it's actually one of the things that I appreciate uh, about DC is that there's sort of a forward momentum, you know, that people come and go, that new heroes rise, that, that sense of legacy, uh, I think uh, serves DC comics really well. 
All right, now, Chris, what is your second friendship that you would like to discuss today? Well, um, I'm, I'm returning to a character that we talk about uh, quite a bit on this show and that uh, I've, I've converted you into an appreciation for, and that is Kitty Pride and my absolute favorite mutant, Kurt Wagner Nightcrawler. Um, and, and I've touched on this relationship a little bit in the past when we talked about God Loves, Man Kills, and, and just the growth in their relationship um, is really powerful and impactful to me. I know that you and I have talked quite a bit about character um, progression and um, and growth. We talked about it a lot with Peter Parker and why One More Day was so upsetting is because it was a regression on all that progress that Peter had made over the years. Um, I remember personal conversations that we had talked about with the MCU with like Black Widow and stuff and and the furthest possible point that that, pair, that character could have you know, progressed. Um, and this is another great example of that. You know, I'm looking at panels right now, um, you know, with the, the first introduction of, of Kitty to Kurt and, you know, him being this really just different looking character. He looks like a blue demon. Um, he has, you know, like two fingers and a thumb he's got three toes he looks looks very very scary you know to her i mean so i'm looking at a panel right now and and she says yikes this is crazy each time i see nightcrawler i flinch i can't seem to help myself i want to like him but he looks so different he gives me the creeps and then you know in in the um very famous uh days of future past arc she comes back to the present timeline and is so happy to see him. And she just grabs him in a big embrace. Uh, he says, aha, our kleine Fraulein is awake. Kurt, it's you. It's really you. It's uh, You're alive. And and it, just so happy to see him. And then you, uh, you know, transition to God Loves, Man Kills. And then you have Stryker saying, human, you dare call that thing pointing at Nightcrawler human. And you go from someone who is absolutely terrified of him uh, to he's more human than you. Nightcrawler's generous and kind and decent. He had every reason to be bitter, every excuse to become as much a demon inside as out. But he decided he'd rather learn to laugh instead. I hope I can be half the person he is. And if I choose to, if I have to choose between caring for my friend and believing in your God, then I choose my friend. And then that's, you know, it's also a very, very powerful statement because Kitty Pride herself is a very devout Jewish woman and, and, and she takes her faith very seriously. Um, and so for her to see someone misuse religion and faith in a form to persecute and to mistreat someone that she has grown to love uh, is, is quite impactful and quite powerful. Um and and their relationship just grows and blossoms over decades and decades of comic books. Um, you know, they go off in the eighties and they join the Excalibur team and they go off to, to Britain to, 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 to join a different team. They branch off from the X-Men, you know, and then they come back. Um, uh, and in, even in current comics, you know, there's, um, you know, in the particularly in the book Marauders, it's just just really beautiful relationship where the where Kurt is writing letters to her as she's off with the Marauders on all these missions, and he's writing you know letters calling her Kate and, and um, you know I miss you so much, and and just this beautiful friendship. Um, it's almost like a you know like a sibling, and and it just really rings true to the heart of why I love the X Men so much, and why I keep coming back to these books, even if the the quality dips a little bit, is is because it's a family, um, and and uh, it's the family that you choose or that found family where you you have no biological relation, but um, you have no biological relation, but um, it, it just means that much more because you've you've grown together. So I will just say it. I had absolutely no idea about the relationship between Kitty Pride and Nightcrawler. None. Absolutely none. And the fact that that, that they're so tight is absolutely fascinating to me. I, I you know, I saw that scene in uh, God Loves Man Kills, um, but I didn't know there had been a progression behind behind that relationship and, and that they were so tight with each other. I'm actually really interested uh, in, in seeing that unfold. Um I would love to you know learn more about that. Uh, I, I was completely clueless, and that sounds like a, a really 
a really special friendship. And it's the kind of friendship that is so interesting in, in comic book media to begin with, or, or really any fiction. And that is when you start from a place of, of fear or not understanding the other person, and then over time are able to grow to appreciate them. Uh, that kind of arc, that kind of growth is always interesting uh, to follow, even more so than two people who just kind of hit it off and are naturally friends. So yeah, I, I want to know more about this relationship. I definitely want to read more about it. Yeah, definitely hit up the Claremont run. And then I have not even read a lot of um, Excalibur issues. Um, so I'm definitely, once I finish up my X-Men read through, which I'm, I'm coming to the home stretch of it. Uh, I, I just crossed over into 2015. And then, you know, I'm all, all the way up to date with the Dawn of X era. So I've only got a couple years worth of comics to read yet. Then I'll, and then I'm definitely planning on going back to Excalibur. And, and the fact that, you know, Fuzzy Elf, she calls him Fuzzy Elf as a term of endearment, uh, you know, just shows the growth. But uh, from even what I saw in the Claremont run, and then even in current comics, it's just a beautiful friendship. And, and I definitely appreciate it. Now, uh, Dave, I have a, I, I know a little bit about the next one, so I feel like I'm progressing here. What's up next for you? Yeah, I would like to talk about Robin and Superboy a little bit. When people today talk about the friendship between Robin and Superboy, they are usually referring to Damian Wayne and John Kent, uh, the most recent iterations of those characters. And while I seriously enjoy their dynamic, I think the friendship between the third Robin, Tim Drake, and Superboy, Connor Kent, is more storied and more dynamic. So first, some introductions. Connor Kent Superboy was introduced into comics after the Death of Superman storyline as an imperfect teenage clone of Superman himself. He'd later be revealed to also contain the DNA of Lex Luthor, answering the age-old question, what if Lex and Clark had a love child? Tim Drake, on the other hand, is the only Robin who actually figured out that Bruce Wayne is Batman. After the death of the second Robin, Jason Todd, don't worry, he got better, uh... Tim tried to convince De Grayson to be Robin again to help center Batman, who was becoming darker and more violent. Instead, Tim ended up taking on the mantle of Robin himself. And really, uh, to my mind, besides perhaps the original, turned out to be probably the best Robin. The two characters met in a series of crossovers that uh, included Impulse, a character from the Flash comic books. And eventually, the three of them became central characters in Peter David's incomparable Young Justice series. Eventually, uh, when Young Justice was canceled, Jeff Johns brought the characters into a new Teen Titans series. Uh, and Connor would uh, ultimately die during the course of Infinite Crisis, seriously devastating Tim and causing him to attempt to bring him back to life. In the end, it was actually Brian Bendis who reunited them in the most recent revival of Young Justice, which regrettably, despite being a fantastic series, has just been cancelled after 20 issues. The two characters basically represent the relationship between Batman and Superman in a new generation, but they also connect on a much deeper level than Clark and Bruce ever have. You know, both Superboy and Robin struggle with wanting to be like their mentors while also becoming their own person, uh, just as one example of a strong commonality they have. And those commonalities connect them in a way that Batman and Superman simply aren't connected. The two characters complement each other. You know, so many team books and the relationships in them seem to matter very little once you return to the solo adventures of the individual heroes. Not so with Connor and Tim. There's always been bleed through from Young Justice and Teen Titans into their individual titles. Um, for example, uh, when Connor died, Tim actually got a new Robin suit. He eliminated the green in favor of a red and black combination as a sign of mourning. Uh, and he wore that for quite a while uh, after that initial uh, death. So... In short, these two characters are, are strongly connected. They have a, a long history. They've served together over several different teams. And they really play off of each other just as well uh, in their dynamic as Batman and Superman do with an added undertone of, of appreciation and, and connection that their mentors simply don't have. In short, uh, these two are always a blast together. Yeah, this is really, really fascinating because the more I see about Tim Drake in particular, the more I'm really, really 
uh, interested in, in diving deeper into the source material. Um, he keeps popping up everywhere uh, that I look. And then, you know, the, I have no exposure to any of the Superboys. So, uh, you know, any new Superboy content is is good good for me. Uh, and, and, you know, even, you know, reading the few Superman issues that I've read, um, you know, based on our conversations and your recommendations, uh, you know, I am very, very interested in, in that entire you know, uh, you know, family of characters. So I, I'm definitely interested to to look into this further. Um, and you know, and, and based in my research, like it was really, really interesting. The mourning process, specifically after Connor's death, um, that that Tim went through. Like he tried to clone him. Like that's super, super intriguing. And then you know, Batman's you know telling him to deal with the grief and mourn properly and and all this stuff in the couple of panels that i saw in my research so it's super super fascinating and, and definitely something that i'm i'm looking forward to visiting yeah and you know again it's it's this is the kind of stuff like for example from a justice league comic book you you wouldn't then go into uh a superman ongoing and expect to see bleed over from the justice league stories uh you know an emotional impact a deeper storyline but with with teen titans at the time you really had that bleeding over into the robin comic and in the, the batman comics so it, it the, the connection between these two characters is intrinsic i don't think you can really speak about tim drake or about connor kent without mentioning them as a duo their their friendship is is core to who they are as characters all right chris bring it on you have another relationship and this one i actually can talk a little bit more about <laughs> well, this one, this one, uh, you know, I, I touched on it with uh, with Kitty and Kurt. Um, I love watching, you know, two characters grow together. Um, and, and specifically, this one it grows uh, from a little bit of animosity, um, you know, into just a lifelong friendship. Um, and that is none other than Captain James Tiberius Kirk and Mr. Spock, the Vulcan himself. Um, and, and a lot of this you know, is, is peppered from the friendship uh, that was built between William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy themselves. You know, I did a lot of work and research reading, you know, the memoirs of William Shatner about Leonard Nimoy after his passing and, and just how close they, they came, uh, you know, cl close friendships that, you know, they had come to be. Um, you know, it's really interesting to see. Um, and if any know anybody knows anything about William Shatner, he's just William Shatner. Like th there are no adjectives for him. It's just Shatner. So like he goes in detail about how you know jealous he was after the first couple of weeks, you know, uh, of of airings that that Mister Spock was the one receiving fan mail and 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 attention from the fans and the reception, and he's like, well, "I'm the captain. I'm the one, you know, leading the storylines. I should be doing all this." And then you know to watch that grow, um, even over you know, when you think about the original series of Star Trek, you just think, "Oh, you know, last forever." It's only three seasons. You know, and then you you transition into the animated series uh, in the seventies, and then you go into the films uh, in, in the late seventies and the eighties, um, and just watching their relationship and their friendship, you know, both on screen and off screen, just grow is just a really really beautiful thing. Um, and and I also just appreciate how complementary they are and their personalities. You know, you have um, you know. Mr. Spock, who is the consummate Vulcan, um, you know, despite his genealogy and everything is based in logic and, you know, strategy and taking the emotion out of the situation. And then you have, you know, Captain Kirk, who is the exact opposite, and he is all piss and vinegar and emotion and, you know, leading, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, his heart and, you know, getting the girl and, and being this, you know, macho, manly, double-fisted, you know, judo chop. Uh, you know, it's just really interesting to see how they complement one another and they work together knowing all of their, you know, strengths and weaknesses and, and as they, they grow together over the years, you know, and, and it's probably the best, you know, in, in the film when you see, you know, Spock sacrificing himself for the needs of the many outweighing, you know, the needs of the few, 
and he you know he puts his hand up uh, on the glass for the Vulcan salute and says you have always been and shall always be my friend I mean like that's one of the most you know emotional scenes that I've ever experienced as a nerd uh, in, in watching that and and it's one of the lasting things one of the lasting legacies of Leonard Nimoy um that that just stays with me whenever i think about him and you know even beyond this into the kelvin universe which gets a lot of flack from uh, a lot of gatekeepers in the star trek fandom but i have a lot of love for the kelvin universe um and it's it's really it's really a tall order to try and capture something when you have individuals like William Shatner and, and, and Leonard Nimoy. But what, what Chris Pine and, and Zachary Quinto were able to capture in just a short time um, it is just really incredible. Um, and, and it really, really makes me miss those films. And I hope that, um, you know, they can get back on track with making those films. I know that it's been put off for quite a while, even before COVID, but, I really think they they nailed it with their chemistry on screen as well. But I just love this is like the OG nerd friendship, um, you know, built out, you know, born of a little bit of animosity and a little bit of derision, but, you know, shows growth um, as the years progressed. Yeah, this one speaks to me. I'm not going to lie. I always loved the friendship between these two. They're so different, as you pointed out, yet perfectly complement each other. You know, Kirk... I think allows Spock to explore his human side in a lot of ways, while Spock tempers some of Kirk's emotional responses with hard logic. They they both kind of give each other the space to to explore parts of themselves that don't come naturally, uh, and that's just a, that's just a great friendship when they really bring out a, a different side in you. You know, the original series itself does a decent job exploring this friendship, but I'm particularly fond of the relationship that the older Kirk and Spock share in the movies. Spock's death scene, as you pointed out in Wrath of Khan, had me tearing up their reunion at the end of Search for Spock uh, when Spock realizes, uh, you know, remembers actually Kirk's first name. That's just a stand up and cheer moment. And even those small conversations that they have about, you know, the Klingons in, in, um, the last uh, Star Trek movie that they shared, uh, Undiscovered Country, are, are just such great little interaction. And yeah, I appreciate the attempts made in the reboot boot Star Trek movies to capture this. Um, and I think it really works in a lot of ways. Uh, the problem, of course, is just one of time, because, you know, obviously being just movies, that there's a limited runtime. And so I, I think they didn't quite fully... Uh, managed to explore that that friendship and and build it up like um, the originals got the chance to do over three seasons of a television show and then six movies. Um, you know, f- funny side note. I think one day for fun, you and I should do a deep dive into a Star Trek novel from 1984 called Killing Time. I don't know if you've heard of this one, but it kind of does some odd, interesting things with the relationship between Kirk and Spock and almost pushes it in a romantic territory. Much has been said about it, uh, and I've not read it in several years. But it's an interesting artifact of 1980s Trek novels, and there are some some odd parallels even to the first movie of the Kelvin timeline with the whole you know alternate timeline and and Kirk is just an ensign and all that stuff. Um, I'd, I'd be curious about your take on that particular book at some point and how it how it changes the dynamic between Kirk and Spock. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, so killing time it is. Yeah, I, I'm I'm totally in. Um, uh, I'm a late addition to the Trek fandom. I didn't get into Trek until my twenties, um, but I I have consumed it ravenously ever since. You know, I binged. Um, uh, all of of TNG, you know, over a, a couple of months. Uh, the the original series, uh, you know, I used to watch nightly. Um, you know, is is sort of almost like a a therapeutic uh, practice. Uh, you know, and I'm working through Deep Space Nine right now um, and enjoying every moment of it. But uh, I'm d- I'm down for a Trek homework assignment. You know, that's ma- you know music to my ears. I also appreciate 
um, you know, the Kirk and Spock relationship because I think it kind of mirrors, pun intended, mirror universe. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there. Um, I think it mirrors, I think it mirrors like like the working relationship and, and friendship that you and I have, you know. You're, you're uh, you know, a lot of logical, like, here's my notes and I'm a lot, you know, I'll have a couple of bullet points, you know, in, in my show notes and like, let's just go with emotion and passion and feeling. And, you know, so I, I kind of see that as a model for how we built this podcast and, and, and you know, kind of grown together and, and learn from one another. And it, and it works. I'm, I'm you know, six months in, I'm still having a blast. Even when we disagree, this is just, this is just a really good time. Because we could still be friends afterwards, even if we disagree. Im- imagine it, uh, if you go. If you go a, what a notion! <laughs> if you if you go on social media, you would certainly believe that that's not possible anymore. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm super excited, um, you know, to to read this novel. Uh, I'm 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 ready to read it right now. So I'm I'm super excited. Uh, now I'm also proud, Dave. The last friendship that you have, I know even more about so like i feel like i'm progressing with each friendship as you list them you know i really wanted to talk about a female friendship because there's so many good female friendships uh in comic books and and us being both male it, it, i think we gravitate towards sort of the bro uh relationships in comic books but but there are really good female friendships and i was kind of torn between this one uh, and the friendship between um, Jessica Jones and uh, Miss Marvel, or, or Captain Marvel now, obviously, but their uh, their friendship is uh, is really interesting to me as well. And one of the corners of Marvel that I actually know quite a bit about as a big fan of of the Jessica Jones comics. Uh, but the relationship I decided to talk about is actually Barbara Gordon, uh, Oracle, and uh, Dinah Lance, Black Canary. So I'm just going to come out of the gate swinging here. The best version of Barbara Gordon is Oracle, not Batgirl. After she was paralyzed in an attack by the Joker, she turned herself into a superhero information broker and hacker uh, that ran support for other superheroes known as Oracle. And this is such an empowering and fascinating time uh, in her story. Um, To get field work done, uh, Oracle decided to team up initially with Black Canary, Dinah Lance, um, for the first time in a 1996 uh, one-shot written by Chuck Dixon. Uh, this would lead to a miniseries and later an ongoing, and the Birds of Prey were born. Black Canary was uh, at this phase written as idealistic, passionate, uh, and constantly clashing with Barbara's more pragmatic take on crime fighting. Over time, the two moved past their differences and became best friends. Gail Simone, one of my all-time favorite writers, and definitely on a list of people I would love a chance to interview, uh, took over the book and added Huntress to the mix. And Huntress, being sort of a loose cannon, became a more regular source of tension on the team, while the friendship between Gordon and Lance continued to strengthen. You know, anytime DC tries to reboot or relaunch, which, as a fan, I will also admit they do way too often... This relationship seems to constantly get the short end of the stick. It's constantly swept under the rug, which is a real shame. It's one of the all-time great female friendships in DC Comics, to the point that it was actually really weird for me to watch the Birds of Prey movie and not see Dinah interact with Barbara Gordon. Uh, I've gone on the record before saying that Journey Smollett's version of... um, Black Canary is one of my all-time favorite versions of that character. But boy, oh boy, would I have loved to see her interact with her best friend, Barbara Gordon. Something about uh, that missing piece just felt wrong in that movie. Now, there's been some interesting developments in recent weeks in the Bat titles. Uh, Cassandra Kane and Stephanie Brown, both who had served as Batgirls in the past, uh, have reclaimed the Bat symbol for themselves and are wearing it on their chest again. And uh, Barbara Gordon even took off the Batgirl suit and briefly returned to her Oracle roots during a storyline called Joker War. Uh, If these are uh, the pieces of a potential new Birds of Prey or Batgirls title, I'm all for that. But I hope they include Black Canary in the mix because I think the friendship between Barbara uh, and Dinah is such an essential ingredient to both characters. Yeah, so I'm I'm super interested because while I am familiar with their character uh, with the, with each of these characters it's usually for their separate, 
you know, stories, um, you know, I, I, especially the video game universe uh, with Injustice and Justice 2 um, and then the Arkham games for, for Barbara herself as Oracle. Um, so I haven't really seen them paired together, but I do know that that Birds of Prey is a fan favorite and, and um, you know, much was made uh, for the development of that film going into it. Um, and, and to see someone as, you know, easily identifiable as Barbara Gordon not be involved was was a little bit weird, um, you know. So um, even as a casual fan, as, you know, kind of like a spectator, it, it was odd not to see her involved in that cast. Um, at the same time, you didn't necessarily have, you know, the build up to that. And, and maybe they want to take their time with that. I know that I've heard rumblings and rumors of a Batgirl, you know, solo flick. So maybe they want to do that first. But, um, you know, I'm super interested to investigate this further. And and, and Birds of Prey, as particularly by Gail Simone, is is one that I have heard recommended time and time again uh, from, from my comic book reading friends. So something I definitely want to dive into uh, going forward. And uh, my exposure to Gail Simone is particularly through Twitter. And um, even that, um, I, I'm dying to have her on the show. So, um, you know, it, it, I, I'm super excited to, to look into this and investigate it further. I will say Simone's Birds of Prey is a masterclass, but I'm also not willing to completely discount Chuck Dixon, who did really, really good work on bad titles for several years during the, uh, during the 90s. He also was responsible for Tim Drake's uh, Robin series for quite a while, um, which was really good. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily skip over the Chuck Dixon years, although uh, Gail Simone stands in a class of her own when it comes to Birds of Prey. Well, all right. It looks like we have covered some fascinating uh, nerd friendships in pop culture. After a quick break. We'll return with our patented nerd commendations. Stick around. And we're back with some nerd commendations. Chris, tell us what should we be reading or watching or listening to right now? Well, I just finished up uh, a really, really interesting crossover called Django and Zorro, and it is everything you think it would be from from the title. Um, this is written by Quentin Tarantino himself, which was really, really interesting to see, um, alongside um, you know Matt Wagner, who uh, you know co-wrote this series and also did some artwork. Uh, also features art by Esteve Poles, um, with some variant covers by Jay Lee and Francesco Francavilla. Um, and you know, it, it, the story is basically what you would think it would be. It's a crossover with this two, you know, really, really popular and really, really, you know, one of two of my favorite characters. Um, so I'm reading the synopsis here. It is uh, set several years after the events of Django Unchained. Django again pursues evil men in his role as a bounty hunter, taking to the roads of the American Southwest. He encounters the aged and sophisticated Diego de la Vega by sheer chance. Uh, Django is fascinated by this unusual character, the first wealthy white man he's met who seems totally unconcerned with the color of his skin and who can hold his own in a fight, even, you know, at his age. Um, Django hires on as Diego's bodyguard and is soon drawn into a fight to free the local indigenous people from brutal serv uh, servitude. Learning much from the older man, as he did from King Schultz, he discovers that slavery isn't exclusive to his people, as he even dons the mask of Zorro in their mission of mercy. Um, and this was just, you know, basically, as advertised, a really, really fun seven-issue crossover between two characters that are very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, Django Unchained is, is uh, you know, one of my favorite, you know, Western uh, type films. Um, I think it's a it's an absolute masterclass performance by Jamie Fox, um, and um, Christoph Waltz does not get enough credit for what an amazing actor that he is. Um, everything that I have seen Christoph Waltz in is absolute gold. I would love to see him, um, you know, as a Magneto. I think he'd be amazing in that role. Um, he was really, really. Uh, amazing inspector as well. Um, 
you know, and then Zorro is probably um, one of the the characters that is that is most important and influential in my life. I saw the Mask of Zorro with uh, you know Antonio Banderas when I was in the fifth grade, and it had such staying power with me. This Robin Hood esque, um, you know, you know, you know, doing it for the good of the people and the masses, and and the you know, the underserved and, and doing the right thing, um, you know, and, and then also the interesting duality of Diego de la Vega. It's almost giving me some Clark Kent vibes where, you know, as his persona as Diego de la Vega, he plays this aloof uh, aristocrat to where you would never suspect the fact that he's, you know, this swashbuckling adventurer. Um, and, and I love that movie and it was so impactful to me that, um, you know, I kind of was just obsessed with Hispanic culture so much so that I made it my career and I went and learned the entire Spanish language, you know, based on this. In my classroom, I have a cardboard cutout of Antonio Banderas as Zorro. Um, and I've even heard rumblings on the Internet that that Quentin Tarantino really wants to turn this into a movie. And it's got its own IMDb page with uh, 2022 uh, you know, tagged next to it, you know, take that for what you will with the current climate that we're in when it comes to making movies, but you know, it's still exciting nonetheless, but this was a really, really fun book. Um, I will say the one thing that made me slightly uncomfortable was, and, and, and Quentin Tarantino has, you know, a problem with this, you know, even in the Django film, which I love, uh, the use of the N word, um, uh, you know, it shows up a couple of a couple of times in script, and it is not blurred out, um, and it is really hard to see. Um, you know, so that made me very, very uncomfortable. Especially, you know, coming from uh, a white guy writing that, it, it makes me really, really uncomfortable. You could easily cover up that that up with a couple of asterisks, but um, you know, all the same, it's a really, really fun adventure book between two characters that I love so much. Um, you know, and doing the right thing and, and, you know, uh, the, you know, doing the right thing for the people. And it's just a really, really fun adventure book, very swashbuckling, very, very fun. And, and, uh, you know, a real page turner. Yeah. You know, you mentioned this book to me before when you first started reading it and I was completely unaware of it. I did not know this book even existed, which is really a shame. I truly enjoyed the film Django Unchained a lot. It was, uh, at the very least, refreshing to see a German on the silver screen not portrayed as an evil scientist or a Nazi villain, for one. Um, <laughs> but there was just a lot of good stuff in that movie, that, and I really, really enjoyed it. But, you know, just as important, I just adore Matt Wagner's work on Zorro. His initial Zorro series for Dynamite was something I collected and adored. And so seeing, you know... Matt Wagner on Zorro again is super exciting. Um, generally, I just enjoy his work, period, both his writing and his art. His output at DC uh, Comics, for example, several years ago, uh, Batman and the Monster Men and Batman and the Mad Monk were such fun reads. So, you know what? This is going at the top of my reading pile. I think I'm going to have to take a break from Miss Marvel uh, just to go ahead and, and, and give this a shot because it looks absolutely fascinating. Well, you'll, you'll be easy to, you know, you'll be able to crank that out pretty easily. Seven issues. Um, and I will say one thing that also caught my attention. It's a joint publishing uh, enterprise between Dynamite and Vertigo, which, you know, that, that rung a bell when I was reading New Dead Guardians for uh, a couple episodes ago for my homework assignment. So I'm, I'm definitely intrigued to look at more Vertigo books, you know, with the, the first two things that I read, uh, truly enjoying. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I sure wish that DC would bring Vertigo back. It's probably one of my favorite imprints of all time. All right, Dave, you are really trying to push the DC agenda this episode. What's what's your nerd commendation for this week? You know, th this among DC fans is probably legendary, but for people who don't, you know, aren't steeped in DC lore, uh, they might not know about this. So I definitely wanted to nerd commend it. So this is a fairly popular DC comic book that many non-DC fans simply know nothing about. And that's 52. Not to be confused with the new 52 reboot. 52 was a weekly comic book limited series published for one year and a grand total of 52 issues. The series was written by some of the all-time greatest comic book writers of the 2000s, including Jeff Johns, 
Grant Morrison, Greg Rocker, and Mark Wade, and it featured layouts by Keith Giffen. After the crossover Infinite Crisis, all DC Comics jumped ahead one year. 52 told the story of that missing year, and was marketed as a year without Batman, Superman, or Wonder Woman. The point of the book was to focus on lesser-known B-list heroes as they deal with various problems during this missing year. The book has several plot threads unraveling simultaneously across this year of stories. And although all four writers had their hands in the book as a whole, you can definitely tell which writer focused on which subplot. Uh, They definitely play to their strengths. Greg Rucka tells the story of The Question, training Gotham City police detective Rene Montoya to be his replacement. Jeff Johns' fingerprints are all over two threads, Booster Gold's story arc, uh, as well as um, the villain Black Adam's attempt to build a family for himself, which uh, ends quite disastrously. Mark Wade focused on Ralph Dibney, the elongated man, as he tries to come to terms with the death of his wife. And then there's my all-time favorite Justice League writer, Grant Morrison, who goes bonkers once again with an island filled with mad scientists who spend half of the book kind of sniping at each other and a group of space maroon superheroes trying to make their way back home. The book is basically a tour through the DC universe, skipping over some of its most famous characters and exploring some of the characters and ideas that make DC so very unique. It almost reads like a jam session between some fantastic jazz musicians. It's some of the world's greatest comic book writers at the height of their abilities, just throwing ideas uh, at each other to see what they can do with them. And although there is the occasional glitch and the occasional rushed plot thread, uh, because it was highly experimental to do a weekly series like this at the time, the team on 52 created something deeply special. I've always enjoyed some of the big-name DC heroes, but it was really 52 that introduced me to a lot of the bit players and the B-list heroes that became my favorite characters, such as Booster Gold. So, although 52 issues seems like a big time investment, if you've ever been interested in some of the the lesser-known heroes uh, and the lesser-known setups that exist in the DC universe, I think 52 is a wonderful gateway uh, that goes way beyond you know, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. So it comes highly recommended. It's a fantastic series. Well, you sold me just based on who's writing this book. I mean, um, you know, Grant Morrison, um, uh, they hold a special place in my heart with uh, New X-Men from from 2001. Mark Wade, um, you know, his history of the Marvel Universe um, and all of my, uh, all the other works I, I've read by him are very, very, you know, near and dear to my heart as well. And then uh, uh, you've recommended, you know, Greg Rucka's work so often to me. And then, you know, Jeff Johns, you know, that name, you know, carries so much weight when it comes to DC content. But, um, you know, also uh, I love Black Adam as a character. I've been super frustrated by the development or lack thereof of this, this film project. Uh, with The Rock, because uh, it's such an interesting and fascinating character to me. Um, you know, so I, I'm I'm definitely, you know, looking for this one, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, Starfire is featured as well. So I, uh, she's one of my favorite, you know, uh, DC characters. So I'm definitely checking this one out. And I will say that uh, Black Adam's arc in this particular book is fantastic, as is uh, Booster Gold's. I would say those two arcs are probably my favorite of the book. Um, and Booster Gold actually got a spin-off series, his own series af- coming out of 52. Um, that was also really, really good uh, and was probably one of my favorite things at the stands at the, on the stands at the time. So th- this just this series has a fantastic pedigree. Well, I mean, that's it for another episode of the Nerd by Word podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoy our podcast, please give us a rating or review and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're available wherever podcasts can be found, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and even Amazon Music. You can also find us on Twitter uh, at Nerd by Word and on Instagram also at Nerd by Word and on both platforms individually at that nerd Chris and at that nerd Dave. And as always, we appreciate your support so much. Uh, you know, our Instagram page is blowing up. We're nearing 1600 followers. I, I, I never would have thought six months ago, I added an Instagram page 
because I just thought it was something that you do and I didn't really do much with it. And then, you know, we're at the point six months later, you know, with nearly 1600 followers. So we thank you so much um, for your support. Um, You know, leave us a five star review. Let us know, you know, in the comments, you know, what you would like to see going forward. Feel free to, uh, you know, engage with us. Uh, and, and we're super excited to, you know, going forward. Uh, and as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd Byword is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez and show art by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available.